This lecture in research methods is on descriptive and qualitative research. Remember that these research approaches differ fundamentally from a much more quantitative or confirmatory approach. In that approach, we set out with a hypothesis that we want to test, and then we collect data to either support or not support that particular hypothesis. Qualitative and descriptive research is much different in which we simply set out to collect more information on a topic. It is considered to be much more exploratory and much more inductive in process than quantitative research. The data that we typically gather using descriptive or qualitative approaches tends to be much richer and more detailed. Researchers often call this a thick analysis because the depth of information that we receive using a descriptive approach tends to be just that. It's very deep and rich and detailed. Commonly, when we're doing descriptive or qualitative research, the approaches that we're going to use include interviews, because sometimes an interview can yield a little bit richer data than a questionnaire. In other words, if the interviewee is leading us one way or another, we can modify our interview questions in a way that we couldn't do with a static questionnaire in which the respondent must fill out just the items that are before him or her. Two other common techniques that we use in descriptive and qualitative research are content analysis and discourse analysis. So I'll be going over each of those as well. In order to follow this lecture, please get the handout that includes content analysis, discourse analysis, and interview data examples. I'm going to be going through them over the course of this lecture. The first thing I want you to look at in the handout are some examples of the data collection instruments that we would use for what's called a content analysis. A content analysis is simply a technique in which we look at some content it can be something like a book, it can be a TV show, movie, commercial, blog site, you name it. And often what we do is prepare some sort of scoring sheet to gather categorical data on the information that we see in our source material. So the first example that I have is an appendix from a research study that was done by a colleague. This is a content analysis on conflict analysis approaches used in children's books. In other words, this researcher was interested in measuring what kinds of conflict resolution approaches were described in children's books. The research team analyzed several hundred books and for each book they had this score sheet. So in the first section, you see the presence or level of conflict. In other words, simply a description of what type of conflict was present. In the second section, what you'll see is a scoring section for strategies to resolve the conflict. And typically, we can see things like withdrawing, verbal fighting, physical fighting, talking out a solution, bringing in another party to help with the solution, or if some other resolution technique was shown in the book, that was described as well. And then the third section, whether or not there was a significant other used to help in the conflict resolution. Sometimes none, but typically when there is a conflict between children or with the child and some other entity, the mother or father could be brought in a significant adult, maybe a grandparent, a peer, in other words, another child, or a formal authority figure, like the police. And then, of course, there's a category for other, if some other character was brought in to help resolve the conflict. So from this description, we can then begin to see a picture emerge of what are the common themes of conflict resolution that are presented in children's book. And then we can start to make some analyses as to whether or not the most appropriate techniques are being shown. If you take a look at the next example, this one is a little bit different. This is a content analysis for books in which there are aging characters. So here we have the number of aging characters, 
the sex of the aging characters, whether or not the aging character is a relative of a main character, whether or not the aging character is central to the theme of the book, in other words, whether or not he or she is a primary character, and then we have some more specific information, more details. What is the role of the aging character? Is this aging character providing support and love, encouragement, is he or she teaching, is he or she there to frighten the other characters with scary information, to punish, or is he or she serving in some ancillary role? Then we have a question about the social status of the aging character. Are the roles of the aging character basically traditional? Not traditional, or it cannot be determined. Where does the aging character reside? Is the aging character portrayed in general as positive or negative? And then is there a clear racial or ethnic heritage presented in the aging character? In other words, the purpose of this content analysis was to determine how aging characters are portrayed in books. Is it mostly favorable or non-favorable? And what role do they play in those texts? The next example is a little bit different. This is an example of what's called a discourse analysis. Discourse analysis is simply a variety of content analysis or a variation. In discourse analysis, conversations are being interpreted and analyzed. So in other words, instead of looking at simple content like what's in a book, what's in TV shows, what's in commercials, what's in music, this is an analysis of conversation, hence that's why it's called discourse analysis. This particular research was done by a statistics professor, and this professor was interested in the types of comments that were popping up on a threaded discussion or an online chat. So what the researcher did was record the different types of comments or questions that were coming up and then categorize them. And what emerged was a couple of major categories of comments or questions. One was remarks concerning lecture problems or examples discussed in the chat. And as you can see, there are several subtypes, an unsolicited statement, a question, a student response to a lecture issue or question, a student response to a problem or example given in lecture, the student was the first to respond to the instructor's question, and the student responded to a lecture status check, which the professor provided. The second theme that emerged was homework-related statements. So we have unsolicited statements, questions about the homework, and then student responses to a homework issue or question. The third category that emerged was remarks concerning course administration, if there was a technology issue or an administrative policy or a class policy. And then the fourth category were simply social remarks, a social statement or a modicon. So in other words, it was the researcher's job, in this case the professor, to go through all of the posted comments, record them, and then try to categorize them into broad categories, like you see the four listed, and then subcategories of those, trying to determine perhaps which was the most common category of statement or question. And from that, the professor could then determine what would be more helpful in the future on those online chats and threaded discussions. So discourse analysis can be done for any kind of threaded discussion, chat, any sort of interactive conversation, even live conversations. You can record them, go back, and then begin to analyze or jot down the different categories of questions and responses that emerge between the parties that are talking. Next, I want to go to a slightly different example. This was an example done several years ago about conflict resolution techniques presented in TV commercials. For this assignment, students had to watch one consecutive hour of primetime television on one of the four major networks, and then for commercials in which conflict was present, perform a content analysis. So only for those commercials in which conflict was present, 
students had to record what the product or service was in the commercial and you can see there is a variety from herpes medication to wireless phone to a minivan to a credit card to a lawnmower to high-speed internet access and to a marijuana education campaign so in each of these very different commercials students recorded major male characters major female characters and the role that they played in the commercial whether or not the conflict was interpersonal that is between parties or intrapersonal meaning the conflict is within the same person next whether or not the conflict was resolved by the end of the commercial and then what resolution technique was used there are several common resolution techniques which you'll see listed so let's go through a few of these. For the first one, we have a product um, of herpes medication, Valtrex. The major male character was a man with genital herpes. The major female character was her, uh, his partner who did not have gen genital herpes. The conflict was interpersonal. In other words, the man and woman were concerned about how to maintain their relationship when one partner had herpes and one partner didn't. By the end of the commercial, the conflict was resolved, and that is by cooperation and collaboration, such that the man should take the medication, in other words, take the Valtrex, and that the couple should abstain from sex during outbreaks. If you move down a little bit more, there is a commercial for a minivan from Toyota, and the major male character role is the dad. There are children in the van, and in this conflict, which is interpersonal, the dad wanted the kids to get out of the van and play in a treehouse that he built, but the van had so many amenities that the kids did not want to get out of the van. They wanted to stay in the van and play and watch TV. By the end of the commercial, the conflict was not resolved. The children ended up staying in the van and the dad walks away. So we would call that technique avoidance. So it's interesting to see Maybe perhaps depending on the category of commercial, we might see different characters who are portrayed in the commercial and what resolution technique is used. But none of that could be determined until we actually sit down and perform a content analysis on conflict presented in TV commercials. I want to switch gears a little bit from content and discourse analysis and talk a little bit more specifically about interviewing. Interviewing is probably the most common way in which descriptive and qualitative research is conducted. Often, not a large sample is needed to conduct good interviews. Sometimes you may not have a large population to draw from, especially if it's a very narrow or restricted topic on which you want to collect some data. If you take a look in the handout, the next page shows some interview data. But before we actually run through an example of how we record and interpret interview data, I want you to take a look at the handout called Interview Techniques. The handout called Interview Techniques. This is a summary of the types of techniques that should be used when conducting good interviews. Now for the purposes of this course, I wanted to present all of these just so if you find yourself in a situation in which you need to conduct interviews, you know what it is that you should do. A good interviewer will establish rapport with the respondent. So as you can see there, a good interviewer should project the positive image of a good person engaged in a harmless but important task. In other words, even if the topic is difficult or personal or sensitive, as we're going to get to in just a little bit with our example, the respondent has to feel comfortable and safe in the interview environment. He or she must feel that it is okay to share data in a meaningful way because sharing the data will help better understand the phenomenon. It is also important for the interviewer to develop trust, mutual respect, and acceptance. In other words, the interviewer must portray him or herself 
as someone who will be accepting of anything the respondent says, no matter how negative, personal, sensitive, or shocking it might be. That is the job of a good interviewer. Let's get down to some of the research approaches that are used, particularly with respect to asking the questions. Just like with good questionnaire research, interview research depends on good questions. One of the most important things to remember is not to ask why questions when they can be avoided. The problem with asking a why question is that it prompts a justification or a rationalization which often puts the respondent on the defensive. In other words, he or she feels like he or she has to justify his or her response or behaviors, actions, beliefs, or attitudes. So whenever possible, we try to avoid why questions and put them instead into how questions. And you can see several examples on that handout. How did you feel at this time? What do you think about? What did you do then? That kind of thing. So in other words, not why did you do what you do, but what did you do or how did you do it? Because that will prevent people from being on the defensive. Secondly, if you want more information, that is, if you want your respondent to elaborate a little bit, on a statement that was just made, we would use what's called a probe. So a probe is almost like a gentle follow-up question to keep the conversation going, but again, without putting them on the defensive. So on the handout, you see some good examples of probes. Was this what you expected? How did you feel about this? Could you elaborate on this? Can you tell me more about that? In other words, you are not indicating any sort of judgment on the statement that was said. You're simply asking the respondent to provide a little bit more information or a little bit more detail to help you as the interviewer better understand the situation. We also try to avoid asking leading questions. This is not a courtroom. This is an interview. So we don't say things like, don't you think that or don't you agree that because that's simply leading the respondent to answer in a certain way. We want the data to be authentic. We want it to be genuine from the respondent as the respondent feels, not led by what the interviewer thinks or what the interviewer feels. On this handout, you will also see some general tips and recommendations for preparing for the interview and approaching the interview. How the questions are worded, we try to use open-ended questions whenever possible the sequence of questions, and then how we conduct the interview. But for the purposes of this lecture, I want to focus on the section of common categories of interview questions because I want you to become adept at understanding and applying those different categories. In no particular order, the first common category of interview questions is behavior questions. What the respondent has done is doing or even even could be doing in the future. So behavior questions stick to the level of what is being done, what is the respondent doing, or what will the respondent do in the future. The second category of questions are known as cognition questions. What the respondent thinks about a topic. In other words, his or her perceptions and impressions. The third category is how the respondent feels about a topic. And there are only a finite set of emotions. Angry, sad, happy, hopeless, frustrated, etc. But there is only a finite list of emotional responses. It is very important to note that emotional questions are often confused with cognitive questions. And the example that I provide there is, I feel confused. Confused is not an emotional state. Confusion is a cognitive state. So you have to be really careful with respect to how you craft your question. So if you say, how did you feel about this? 
don't accept a cognitive response. I feel confused would not count as a feeling if you really want a feeling. I feel angry. I feel sad. I feel upset. I feel happy. I feel relieved. Those are emotional states. If you want a cognitive response like confused, please make sure you ask a cognitive question. The next category is knowledge, what the respondent knows about a topic. And the last general category is simply background or demographics. So questions referring to things like age, educational level, number of children, marital status, that kind of thing. What I'd like for you to do next is take a look at the handout that is called Sister Care Services. Sister Care Services. Sister Care is a program for women and their children residing in Richland, Lexington, Fairfield, Newberry, and Kershaw counties in South Carolina. The services are provided for women who have been abused and their children. And on this handout, I have a list of some of the services that Sister Care provides. So I want to take a minute to go through an example of how we could conduct an interview with those five categories of questions. The example that you see on this sheet is that you are designing a program evaluation for Sister Care. And this is a very common application of interviews to do program evaluations. You have been asked to create interview questions to assess the transitional housing program. So let's take a moment to read what the transitional housing program does. Domestic violence victims and their children transition from sister care emergency shelters into homes throughout the Midlands where they receive counseling, parenting services, financial assistance, and services to help them gain employment, education, and vocational training to become financially stable. So in other words, this is for women and their children who are transitioning out of the emergency shelters into homes and they are providing, they are provided the training and assistance that they need to become independent, to go live on their own with their children. So we're going to do a program evaluation of the transitional housing program. So what I've asked you to do is create two questions for each category below. And I want you to use open-ended or categorical questions only. Categorical questions would probably be most appropriate for the background or demographics category. So avoid yes-no questions because, again, open-ended questions keep the conversation going. Yes-no questions do not. So I want to give you some examples of each of these five categories of questions so you would understand how to develop your own interview questions for different aspects of sister care or any other program evaluation. Some examples of behavior questions would include what services are you utilizing? What are you doing to maintain your physical health? while in the program? Which activities have you participated in? And what actions have you taken to become more independent? So notice these are about things that the respondent is potentially doing and perhaps will do in the future. But what is the participant doing or what has she done? Those are behavior questions focusing on actual behaviors. Cognition questions. Remember these questions are about perceptions and impressions. In other words, what the respondent thinks. So let me give you some examples. How do you think your children have benefited from the program? Which aspects of the program do you think need improvement? What potential problems do you foresee when the program ends? So notice these are all questions that ask the respondent to think about the issues at hand. They are not meant to generate a feeling. It's not how do you think you will feel when the program ends. It's what potential problems do you see. 
What do you think about this issue? The next category is emotion questions. Sometimes children blame parents for being in a transitional situation. Could you talk about how that makes you feel? Now here we are actually prompting for an emotional response because as we assist and empower these women, we have to address their emotions as well as their cognitions. We have to address both. Can you describe any anxiety you feel about transitioning from the emergency counselors to the regular counselors? And that's kind of a yes or no question, but we can prompt and probe a little bit to see how, how the respondent is feeling a little bit. How safe do you feel in the transitional housing facility? I think it's safe to say that safety is a feeling. You feel safe you feel secure because that's going to lead to less anxiety and less fear. And anxiety and fear are definitely emotional states. So again, emotion questions get to the feeling. Cognition questions get to the thinking. Okay, knowledge questions. When you have a victimization issue, how would you find the right phone number to call? How about, what are two of the referral agencies we've discussed? So in other words, knowledge questions get to what the respondent knows. And it is very important to get this information because in the end, it's going to be the knowledge that helps these women transition back into the community and into a successful job and home life with their children. And then lastly, for the category of background and demographics, let me give you a few sample questions. What is your highest level of education? How long have you been in the program? How many similar programs have you been in or been to? So again, this just gets some background or demographic information on the respondent. These tend to be pretty straightforward questions, and they can sometimes be categorical in which from these categories, please choose a response. However, it's just as convenient to leave them open-ended. So those are some examples of the five major categories of interview questions. And I want you to be able to provide examples of each one for any kind of interview topic or situation. The last thing I want to do is to go through an example of some data generated via interview. So if you go back to your handout on content analysis, discourse analysis, and interview data examples, the very last piece is an example of interview data that were collected by a researcher on domestic violence victims who were in mediation for divorce. So if you take a look at those data, it says interview data, common themes. A total of 60 domestic violence victims were interviewed for the project. The participants included 20 black females, 20 Caucasian females, and 20 Hispanic females. And what has been generated are the common themes that were gathered during the interview process. Mediation for domestic violence can be tricky because mediation requires the two parties to sit down in a room with a mediator who is a neutral third party. Oftentimes in cases of divorce, mediation is court ordered. However, in the case of domestic violence, mediation seems a little bit less appropriate because the victim is sitting in the room with the alleged offender. So no matter what happens during the mediation process, it tends to put the victim in a position of powerlessness because he or she is sitting there with the alleged offender, with the alleged violence offender. So this student recognized that there were potential issues with using mediation for divorce cases in which domestic violence was present. So she wanted to do a little bit, a, a little bit of research on this topic and what some of those problems were. So if you take a look, there were 41 of the 60 cases that were court ordered in other words, the mediation was court ordered, it was not voluntary, and 19 that were voluntary. So about a two-thirds to one-third ratio of court ordered to voluntary. 
Was your attorney present? You'll notice that in 34 of the cases, the victim's attorney was not present. The mediated issue, most of them obviously had to do, well, all of them had to do with child custody. And the most common one was child custody only. In other words, who has primary custody of the child? How many sessions did it take? Luckily, for the majority of the women, just one session. The gender of the mediator. Again, this might not be a critical issue, but it is something to consider, particularly if the victim is female. But if you'll notice, for 48 of the 60 cases, the mediator was male. The mediator performance. 23 were not pleased with the mediator performance, and 19 of those women had the same mediator. In other words, the same person was being ordered or asked by the court or paid by the court to conduct the mediation, but this person had unsatisfactory performance evaluations by the victims. So here were some of the issues leading to the dissatisfaction. The mediator answered his cell phone during the session. The participants felt they were harassed about payment up front. Participants were left alone in the room with the abusive husband. And if you'll notice, that happened in about a third of the cases. So imagine how those women felt during that time. For 23 women, the participants felt the process was rushed in order to reach an agreement. 23 of the participants did not feel that they, or did not think that they participated equally in the discussion. In 16 of the cases, the mediator knew the husband or the husband's attorney. So again, think about how that reduces the balance of power in the situation. And then for all 23 women, they did not feel empowered after the mediation process. In terms of satisfaction, 37 were pleased with the performance and the process. All of the 12 female mediators were praised for their sensitivity. And 25 male me mediators were also praised. So common reasons, they did not feel rushed. The husband was not allowed to dominate the discussion. The session started on time. Both parties were given equal participation. They were given ample time to re review the agreement with their attorney, and the participants felt empowered. So luckily, there was many cases in which there was satisfaction, even though this is a very potentially sensitive situation to be in. Take a look at the next page. There are some other themes that emerge with respect to the interviews. The next one is compliance with the settlement. 23 were not pleased with the agreement or compliance. 12 of the women were not receiving child support and visitation was not being utilized for 11 of the participants. With respect to safety issues, five participants received harassing phone calls, presumably from the spouse. Two participants were followed to their car, presumably by the alleged offender in order to initiate conversation. Pretty scary situation. And then custody issues. 57 of the women were able to maintain custody of their children. Three were not. And then child's adjustment since the mediation. Seven were currently displaying behavioral problems. And then the researcher <clears throat> simply listed some of the common themes expected from the mediation. In other words, what the women expected <clears throat> going through this process. So again, as you can see, some pretty rich and detailed information can emerge from interviews. Now the question is, what's the next step with these data? And the answer is, there isn't necessarily a next step. Descriptive and qualitative research simply provides a first step in better understanding the situation. Where the researchers go from here with the data, you know, there are endless possibilities and endless opportunities, but oftentimes results like these can help bring awareness to a problem or an issue that needs to be resolved.